awesome. This group leads worship for us every Wednesday night. They get here early to practice. They've been here since just about 7.30 this morning, practicing, getting ready for you guys. So Garrison and Gabe and Lalo and Connor and Aiden, thank you guys so much for your heart to worship and lead us, guys. I appreciate you very, very much. Well, uh, my name is Ryan Phillips. I'm the student pastor here at Hopewell, and I am very sleepy. So... Uh, the flesh is very weak, but the spirit is very, very willing and strong this morning. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, don't know what in the world's going on. We are coming off our student uh, retreat weekend that we call Disciple Now Weekend, uh, which is our biggest weekend of the year. And it has been absolutely amazing uh, with very little sleep. It's amazing. Pastor Dave said it great on social media today. He said, it's amazing what you can do on little sleep and zero sleep. It's cool to see what God can do through that. But it's been an amazing Weekend, and I, I want to give a quick shout out to a couple of folks uh, who are here with us today. So, if you have served in any capacity this weekend from Friday all the way to even this morning, that is anything, whether you've been a host home, a small group leader, you've been cooking food, which we have a group that's been cooking all weekend and is still over there. Sandra and Barry Ladd and their team is over there right now. You've greeted. You've, you've delivered and picked up luggage. That's a very unpopular thing to do, but it's a great way to serve. If you did any of that this weekend, could you stand up so we can recognize you and say thank you for all that you've done? <laughs> Guys, this weekends like this and, and vacation Bible school at this church does not happen without this church being willing to sacrifice a weekend. And I'm telling you, I, I know how precious weekends are to us. That's a good time to rest and be with family. And a lot of these guys and gals have, have opened their homes and they sacrificed a weekend to not sleep, I can assure you that, and to love and to pour into these teens. And so I appreciate you guys very, very much. I appreciate a church that believes in pouring into our next generation, all the way from children preschoolers, babies who are just experiencing the first tastes of love from the people who serve in our nursery all the way to our college age kids. This church believes in this next generation. I believe in this next generation that God will use them to do great and mighty things. So thank you for being a church that invests in that and wants to see that spread through our community. Amen. So thank y'all very, very much for that. Hey, if you got your Bibles, I want you to open up with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. As we were, where we will be this morning. While we're doing that, I do want to quick give a, another quick shout out to a couple of folks who are watching online with us. Uh, we had a chance to go out into our community and to serve uh, in many places. Our kids served in lots of places all over Hall County. One place in particular who watches us every week online is Manor Lake, which is an assisted living home in Gainesville. So guys, thank you for tuning in and being with us. And thank you for uh, allowing our girls to love on you, but you loving on our girls as well. So thank you very much. They actually have a resident that's with them that was with our girls last night who's turning 100 years old today. Today is her birthday. So happy birthday to you. We celebrate with you. But anyway, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This weekend, our theme uh, for D now was the uprising. Guys, I don't know if you've been noticing what's going on in our nation right now, and it's starting in our college campuses, if you haven't noticed, but revival is breaking out. God is at work. The Spirit is moving, and people don't want to leave it. They want to saturate in that. And I believe that in moments like that, people are going to go out, and we are going to see an uprising of this next generation do great and mighty things for the glory of God. I believe this crew right here, is going to go into Gwinnett, Hall, and Jackson County and do great and mighty things for the glory of God. It's not a weekend thing. This is a springboard into what should be lifestyle change. And I know that these guys are fired up to go and to do that. And I hope that we will all be ready for that as well. So kind of, let me get you guys caught up on where we have been this weekend because I want you guys to be where we are as well. Our speaker, Trey Hildebrand, a great friend of mine, a, a pastor at 12 Stone Church, and Snellville was uh, with us this weekend. Let me, let me tell you some of the things he shared with us so that you are with us, okay? So the first thing he said is, because there is no one like our God, we are to rise up and worship. Not just here on Sunday mornings or on Wednesday nights, but with our lives, amen? He also said, because Jesus died for us, we are raised to new life. How many of you guys are thankful for new life in Christ this morning? 
Me too. And because God loves us greatly, we rise above the world and love at all costs. That is where we have saturated in. We saw lives changed. We saw chains broken this weekend. And we saw students step from death to life and give their life to Jesus this weekend because of that word from God. And we celebrate that. So as we get ready to kind of dive into today's word, I I gave Wesley a little bit of heads up. Uh, By the way, uh, I need to give Wesley a shout out this weekend. That's the man behind the curtain that makes everything happen, and he is awesome. (laughs) Pastor Clay Marchbanks, our worship pastor, says it best, and you need a t-shirt that says, everybody needs a Wesley. (laughs) Everybody needs a Wesley, not just someone who serves faithfully. And I mean, this was above and beyond his time. Uh, But you need a friend like Wesley, too. He's an awesome dude. So thank you. But I did give Wesley a heads up this morning that I was going to move a little bit. Uh, So the camera guys, y'all don't freak out. I know that that's like kind of out of y'all's zone right here. We got to get out of our comfort zone. There's a message in that, too, for another day. That's cool. But I'm going to ask you guys a question. I'm going to ask a couple folks a question, okay? So don't freak out if I call on you, all right? I'm not going to make you stand up, tell your name or anything. This isn't summer camp. We're not going to do that, okay? But I want you to tell me what do you love? What is something that you love? Okay, it could be, that's a very broad question. It could be anything. It could be a person. It can be a thing. It can be food. It can be a sports team. Anything in the world. I want you to tell me why you love it. All right, I'm going to start right here, David. Good morning. David, what do you love? I had a feeling you were going to say your grandkids and your wife. Thank you for pointing that out too. I appreciate that. Okay. David, why do you love your grandkids? You don't have to yell. I'll, I'll share with everybody for you. Because <laughs> they love God. And you and their mom and dad, despite their greatest efforts, have, have done a good job to do that. You know, They are. They're good. Why should other people love your grandkids? Because they will see Christ in them. That's good. Christ is magnified in them. We're just saying that. That's great. Let me move over here. Clint. Hey, Clint. How you doing, man? Clint, what do you love? What is something you love, man? What do I love? My wife and God. Your wife and God. Can't go wrong with those answers. That's good. I'm going to focus on your wife for a second because there's so much you could say about God. I want, I want people to know how awesome Lisa is. Why do you love your wife? She's just always been there for the family, looks at other people first. Yeah. Um, yeah, she can be a little sometimes. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to share that with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Why should other people love Lisa? Amen. I believe that wholeheartedly. I've been a beneficiary of that throughout my life as well, because she will put others first. That will happen. Let's get out here and find somebody who's sleep deprived that hasn't slept all weekend and came to my house and pranked it. All right. How about over here? Tanner. Tanner, what is something that you love? Your family. Great answer. Very cool. Why your family? What, what do you love about your family? That's a good family. If, if, if you mess up and your family loves you through it, just like imaging God, that's good stuff. So why should others love your family? Same thing? Yeah, they're going to make sure that you are standing up strong and they're going to, that's all great stuff. Every single person in this room could probably tell me something. I was really hoping somebody would tell me some kind of food, all right? I've been on a food kick here lately, but everybody wanted to be like, my family, my grandkids, that's, and that's good. You want to know what I love, guys? I love the Georgia Bulldogs, all right? Now, let me give a quick shout out to whoever came and destroyed my home, um, I, there are many things that I can stand. I can stand toilet paper in my trees. I can stand confetti that's on my porch and on my driveway right now. What I cannot stand for is my windows, which face the road. It's the first house in the neighborhood, so we're the welcoming committee. I cannot stand in giant letters to see Roll Tide <laughs> facing the crowd. 
And then when you walk up to my front door on a little window right to the right of the door, it says Rocky Top. <laughs> Hashtag back to back. So what's up? <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I love the Georgia Bulldogs. It, and I tell you guys this, not because I love sports, not because I love football or baseball or basketball or basketball. They're not good this year. But anyway, we'll focus on football. But I love that because it is my first memories with my family. That's a big deal to my family to spend time together. So when I think of Georgia and I think of the Bulldogs, yeah, we can think of guys like a Herschel Walker or a Champ Bailey or a Boss Bailey or a David Pollock or a a Stetson Bennett throughout the history. But when I think of the Georgia Bulldogs, I think of my mom and dad. I think of my grandmother and my grandfather. And I love that about them. And the reason why I want people to love the Georgia Bulldogs, not because they win ball games, or at least they have been here lately, but because it is a great bonding experience for you and your friends. And I want people to appreciate things like that. So we can all share things like that. So that is why it is important for you to share about the stuff that is passionate to you. But what I want us to get, guys, is that Because of who Jesus is in our lives, if we truly have new life in Jesus, we shouldn't have to, but we should want to tell others about him. Amen? We should have that heart. Guys, if we love something, our love is only increased when we tell others about it. I'll say that again. Our love for something is only going to increase when you're telling others about it, not keeping it to yourself. That is for anything. So the good news that Jesus died, for, died on our cross, sacrificed himself for our sins, and most importantly, rose again to offer us eternal life is not meant to be a secret. It is not meant to be kept to yourself. It is meant to be shared. Guys, if the gospel is important in our lives, then it is important that we share it. If the gospel really has changed you and transformed you into new resurrection life, as we just sang, we should want to share that with others. And we have been commissioned to spread this news to others, but oftentimes what happens, what happens when we think about the Great Commission, we know that is something Jesus told us, but for some reason in our minds, and it's really the enemy that does this, he feeds your mind and he tries to put chains on your mind to say something like that you are not qualified to do it. You ever thought that about yourself before? I'm not qualified to talk about Jesus. I'm not good enough. I'm not gift enough to do it. I'm too plain. I've done too much. I have a reputation. And so we put in our mind that we cannot share Jesus and we're not qualified to do that. Well, here today, I'm going to share with you a little example. And Paul gives us an example of what that looks like. He shares a little testimony of his own personal life. And we're going to learn a lesson from that. And so how we can go and raise up, raise high the banner of the gospel in our world today, okay? So if you would stand with me, we're going to read just a few verses at the beginning of chapter two. Paul speaking to the church at Corinth. This is a very young, very undisciplined bunch who's trying to figure it all out. And they have divisions. They have quarrels with one another. And so Paul is trying to ring them back in. All right? So listen to what he says. Verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 1 says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, And in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words or human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Mm. Let's pray real quick. Father, thank you so much for, again, this weekend. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're going to do. And Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I think that there's one thing that we could do more of each day, God, is to make a big deal of you. Father, we talk about all the things we love and we're passionate about in the world, Father. I pray that we would be more passionate about you and your son and the blood and the cross 
and an empty grave than anything else in our lives. And would we share that? Father, speak to us this morning. I pray that you would change hearts and change lives, that we would be more on fire and more passionate to live out the gospel and be a light in this dark world than ever before. Would you change lives for salvation's sake this morning? Someone is here on the fringe and on the line that is ready to take a step forward and to surrender it all. Would you speak to their heart this morning when they give their life to you? We love you, praise you, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, you can have a seat. So again, as I was telling you, Paul is now on his second missionary journey that he's going on, and he's, he's come to Corinth, and he stayed there for about a year and a half. And in that year and a half, during that time, people came to follow Jesus because of Paul's ministry that would become the nucleus of that young Corinthian church that we were just talking about. I told you they were young, they were undisciplined, and now they're a divided church that's in need of some guidance, and Paul is trying to redirect their focus back to where we all need to make things about ourselves. And that is two things, Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus and Jesus alone. Guys, when you place the head and reason for the church at the focus of all things, whether, they're in, whether in the church or in life, you will find that there is very little, if any, division or issues. You don't believe me? Try it. Place Jesus at the front of everything, and everything works itself out. And Paul's trying to redirect their focus into that. So how do we use this little example of Paul kind of being a little vulnerable with us, which I appreciate, and being vulnerable with these folks, and, and, and just reminding us that he is just a guy, that you cut him, he bleeds just like us? How do we use this example of Paul to rise up as the church of Christ and proclaim the gospel with our lives? Well, if you read through this text, guys, there are three things that we can realize. So if you're taking notes, I really encourage you to write this down, especially if you are someone that feels like you get anxious and you kind of clam up and you don't feel like you can share Jesus with someone, but you want to. We're ready to take a step forward with that. If that's you, I encourage you to write these things down and go back and check yourself this week in this scripture, okay? So there's three things we realize. The first thing is this in verse one, we realize the power of plain. What? The power of plain. Guys, if you read right here, Paul is not a very impressive looking or sounding guy. He's really not. He says, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. He's very ordinary. He's very plain. So if that ordinary guy, how in the world can an ordinary guy walk into one of the epicenters of worldly, wild, unrestrained lifestyle and see people come to God through Jesus and begin a church? How does that happen? Because God uses ordinary people to show just how almighty and how powerful he is. That is the measure of his majesty. Just a few verses before that, in, in chapter 1, if you look just a few verses up in, in 127, Paul says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put the shame, the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put the shame, things which are mighty. And then down at verse 31, he says that because it is written, he who glorifies, let him glory in the Lord rather than himself. So God chooses to do that. So let me tell you something, guys. If you're here this morning and you identified one of those things that I said earlier, if you think that you are too simple, if you think that you can't speak well, if you think that you've got too much of a reputation from your past, that you doubt yourself too much, guess what? You're perfect. God can use that. If you will just lay that down, that is the prerequisite on a resume to say, how can I know that I can share the gospel? Put those things down. If Jesus is at the foundation of that and Jesus is the one doing that, he can use that. He can use you. How do you know that, Ryan? Because this tells me. You know why? Because God used a drunkard in Noah. God used a murderer in Moses. God used an adulterer in David. God used corrupt tax collectors and backwoods redneck fishermen to change the world. That's us. We can do that. And if you don't believe that God can use his power through you, why? 
Because God is mighty. God is powerful. And I'm telling you, that's the first thing that you have to do is just know that if you're plain and you're simple and you're not well-spoken and you're not well put together, you're not a master craftsman at public speaking, you know what? He can use that because that's the measure of his majesty. He's a great and powerful God. I had a pastor at one of my old churches who said something great. He said, I will not take a dog that won't bite, a gun that won't shoot, and a God that won't move through people. We serve a mighty God who moves in people because he is mighty and he can do that. So realize that there is power in your plainness if you identify in that this morning. All right, second thing is this. We need to realize the power of priority. Realize the power of priority. Guys, the single greatest moment in the history of the church and really all of recorded history happened on a cross on the outskirts of Jerusalem and three days later when a grave was checked and it was found empty. Single greatest moment in the history of the world. That alone is the difference in me being buried in my sin, being destined to eternal damnation, separated from my creator with no hope, with no joy, and with no peace. Without that, I have nothing. We have nothing without that. So Paul's priority of ministry was very, very simple. And he said it in verse two. I determined not to know anything among you except two things. That was Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's it. Paul's priority was simple. Know Jesus, know his crucifixion, and know his resurrection. Plus or minus nothing. That was it. There's a great, uh, there's a great uh, missionary who spoke to the Native Americans for many, many years, a great missionary called David Brainerd. And in his diary at the end of his ministry, he wrote this. He said, I never got away from Jesus and him crucified. He said, I found that when my people were gripped by this great evangelical doctrine, I had no need to give them instruction as about morality. It spoke to themselves. One followed as sure and as inevitable as the fruit of the other. When you think about those corrupt tax collectors and those back, backwoods redneck fishermen that we were talking about that wrote the gospels that we read about, the four gospels tend to focus on different aspects of Jesus' life so that we can see different things to get a picture of the key moments of his time here on earth. But where they don't diverge on, guys, is the inclusion of his sacrifice on the cross. Why? Because Christ and him crucified is the single most important message for everyone in the world to hear. Nothing else matters. That is the single most important thing for every living person on this earth to hear. That is the power of the cross and of resurrection, that it changes people so much that you don't even have to necessarily teach, teach morality. The power of the gospel does that to us. It changes our lives. It switches us from old self to new self, as Paul writes about as well. So when we realize that we are bound in sin, when we, when we realize that we're bound in sin, and that the nature of sin is something so heinous that it would literally take nailing the Son of God to the cross to set people free from it, Nothing else takes priority. That's why it was the only thing that Paul wanted to make sure that people knew about. So Paul also tells the Roman church in another letter that we read about quite frequently that, that us, for us, it is very simple and easy way to be free from that heinous sin that we talk about. We as people, we try to create our own understanding and try to sound theologically impressive sometimes when it comes to salvation to make it feel like there is this huge thing that you have to do how many guys like math in this room actually better question who does not like math in this room <laughs> okay a lot of you guys identify with me okay guys I can't stand math I'm not good at it my wife is great at it I'm terrible at it okay but Paul makes it very simple very simple math equation y'all ready he writes it in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And it's quite simple. If you wrote it on a whiteboard, it would say, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, plus 
believe in your heart that Christ raised him from the dead, or that he raised Christ from the dead, that equals you will be saved. It's simple math. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe wholeheartedly in your heart that he was raised from the dead. God's word. That's not Ryan's opinion. That's not somebody trying to break anything down for you. I'm just telling you, God's written word says you will be saved. That's all you have to do. If we as the church or us as a believers ever get to the point where the cross, the blood of Jesus, or an empty tomb doesn't excite us and spur us on each day, we're failing. If you don't get excited about what the blood has done in your life, you need to check your heart. If you don't get excited that there is an empty tomb when you feel like you're in the pit, and that is what gives you joy and that alone, something needs to be checked. But guys, we should live that. People should see joy. There should be something different about the church of Christ because of those things. There should be something different about the way we speak and the way we walk and the way we act and our attitude. It should be different. People should see that. So make that your priority. If nothing else, realize God can use your plane and God is the priority. Jesus and Him crucified. If you will stay with that, God can use that. That speaks alone. You don't have to advertise that. I've always heard you don't have to advertise a fire. People see it and they get drawn to it. That's what Jesus does. That's what the gospel does. You don't have to advertise it. There is something enticing about it. Even people who despise it, who reject it, who don't believe it, even they dedicate so much time to trying to debunk it and focus on it because it speaks. There's something powerful about it. You can't deny it. So make that your sole priority. The last thing is this, guys. Realize the power of flame. Realize priority. And the final thing is realize the power of God. Realize the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Guys, if you look here, starting in verse 3, Paul here admits that he came to the Corinthians in what? He said, in weakness, in fear, and in trembling. Weakness, fear, and trembling. How many of you guys feel those kind of things stir up inside of you when you know that God is stirring in your heart to share Jesus with someone? I feel it too. But you know what? That is a very healthy attitude to have in preparation for your own personal ministry. If these guys got up on stage to lead worship and they felt confident just in themselves and like, I've got this, I can do this, this is my gift, I can do that, and they felt no anxiousness about it at all, then we're kind of worshiping ourselves. But I can assure you, just like I do every time I get up to speak, I can promise you they felt a little anxious, they felt a little trembling, because they want to use the gift that God has given them well to glorify Him. And it's not their power, it's not their thing, it's what the Holy Spirit does through them. It's the same thing for all of us, guys. So that's a healthy attitude. If you will come in there with trembling, and humility, God can use that. He will use that. In John chapter 14, when Jesus is kind of getting ready to set his disciples up, those backwood redneck fishermen again that we talk about that he spent so much time with, he's getting them ready because he's getting ready to leave. He's getting ready to came what he came to earth to do. And Jesus recorded in John 14, he says this. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So Jesus, who is physically on earth, walked with them and they saw him do all these great mighty things. You know that they just kind of rode the coattails with him a little bit. Now all of a sudden he's like, all right, I'm getting ready to go. I'm not going to be here. And you can imagine they're all kind of like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what are we supposed to do? He says, don't worry about that. He says, guys, 
I am going to send you a helper. My Father is going to send you a helper in the Holy Spirit. Guys, if you belong to Jesus Christ today, you have that Spirit inside of you. You have that power inside of you. It resides within you. So he's not going to leave us hanging. Jesus promised his disciples, and really he's promising us, he's not going to leave us hanging. I'm not going to make you do all this by yourself. I've got you. I've got power for you if you will use it. As the band goes ahead and kind of starts making their way up, I'm going to wrap it up like this. I want to remind you of one thing. That same group, now Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, his final thing that he says to them, he says, before I leave, all authority is given to me. And guess what? And you, what, shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We read that and we quote that all the time, but do you realize that God just said that you will It's not a, I think it might. You need to check on it a little bit. He says it will happen. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Do you know what that means, guys? That means that God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity together trusts us with that. Wow. God trusts us with the power of the Holy Spirit. What a humble privilege. How cool is that? So just know this. Know this. Guys, if you ever find yourself in a moment where you see the opportunity to share Jesus and you don't know what to say, you don't know what to do, do me a favor. Just keep stepping towards that light one step at a time and just trust that God will give you the right words at the right moment. He will. He'll give it to you. In a moment where one of those guys, one of those plain, simple guys that we just talked about, Moses, had a moment where he met God in the form of a bush that was burning and was not being consumed. Man, how cool would that be? That's awesome. So can you imagine seeing that with your own two eyes? And not only that, we hear God through His Word and through the Holy Spirit through our, through our consciousness. But Moses audibly heard the voice of God. And God told him what he was going to do through him. Could you imagine seeing that with your own eyes and hearing that with your own ears and then have the audacity to say, well, I don't know if I can do that, God. I can't really speak real good. <laughs> he said that. And God said, you do not worry about that. I'm going to help you. I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to give you this. And when people ask you when, what is causing this to happen? Who is doing this? Who sent you? I am sent you. I am that I am sent you. Guys, I am is with us today. I am is in your heart if you belong to Jesus. I am will be the one to use you for great and powerful things. Students, look at me real quick. I know half of y'all are asleep. Hang with me, okay? Look at me. Look. I love you. If you don't know that, know I love you. But above that, God, Jesus loves you abundantly more than I ever could. And he will use you guys, just like we talked about last night, to do something radical and amazing on your school campuses and in your homes with your families, and on your ball teams, and in your bands, and in your clubs, he will use you to do great and mighty things. Because you know what? We're plain and simple dudes and dudettes, right? God can use that. If you'll realize that, also know this. Just make him your priority. Just speak Jesus. Don't worry about nothing else. Just speak about Jesus and your story, what he's done in your life. And God will give you the power and the right words in the right moment, guys. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be a stretch because some of us are not used to it. But I promise you, if you will just take a leap of faith and trust and believe that God can and will use you, he'll do it. That's for all of us. You think you're too plain? You think that you've messed up too many times in your past, guys? 
God can use that. You think you can't speak good? God can use that. Speak of your story. Nobody knows your story better than you. This is who I was before Jesus. I did have a past. I did have a reputation. I did have all these things. I I was timid. I did question and doubt myself. But then Jesus. I realized my need of Jesus. I realized the love Jesus had for me. I realized what Jesus did on the cross for me. And above that, I know that Jesus is now alive today. That's the X factor. And because I have confessed with my mouth and believed in my heart that he is Lord, I am now a new creation. That's it. God will use the Holy Spirit if you will access that power that is inside of you. Every single one of us have it. So as we get ready to respond, in just a moment, you're going to have pastors down front. If you need to come forward, and there's a couple of folks in this room, maybe that is you, maybe you are saved, you have a relationship with Jesus, but that's been you. You, you have it, the greatest thing you say it's the greatest thing that you have in your life it's the greatest thing but we're not sharing it you haven't shared it with anybody you're not audibly telling it if the only thing that people knew about me was that I love the Georgia Bulldogs and and just stuff like that well then you know what that's there's not a lot of depth to that that doesn't fight that doesn't give fuel Jesus if that's all they knew about me If these kids 20, 30 years from now only remembered Christ and Christ crucified because of my ministry, then that's all I needed. They don't need to know anything else about me. That's it. That's the greatest thing. So if that's you and you're saved, just realize that God can use your plainness. God can use that. That you want to make him your priority in your life and that's all that people can see no matter what you're doing through your job, through your family, Your homes, guys, our homes, protect your homes. Make Christ, put a stake in the ground and say, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Teach your children his word. Teach them about the blood. Teach them about the crucifixion and teach them about the resurrection. If that's all they hear from you, you're doing it right. You're doing it right. So maybe you just need to come and you need to pray. The altars will be open. You just come and pray. Pray that God would help you to access that power of the Holy Spirit that he's given to you. Pray that you would be bold and courageous enough to take a step out on a limb and do something that may be just a hair out of your comfort zone and share Jesus. You probably all have someone that you've been praying about or know somebody in your life that needs Jesus. Would you be bold and courageous enough, maybe even today, this week, to seek them out and to realize those powers? Would you pray about that? If you are in this room and you have never in your life realized the power of an empty grave or the power of a cross that was built for humility and shame, realize that that alone created the greatest moment in the history of the world in this life and the next. And it has the power to change you. That reputation that you're holding on to and think that nobody can love you and nobody can use you, guess what? Jesus saw you at your very worst in that worst moment and said that while you were still a sinner, I died for you. That's the measure of his love. Would you be willing to come and lay that down? Say, I need Jesus. I want Jesus. I want that stuff to remain in my past. I want to know that I have a new creation identity in Christ. If that's you, would you be bold enough to come forward and just grab one of these pastors and say, I need Jesus. I want Jesus. We'll show you from God's word how you can do that. Guys, the weekend's wrapping up. It's been a little over 48 hours. We're all on a high. We're tired, but we're on a spiritual high. Same thing I told you last night. Tomorrow's going to come. Monday is going to come. What is going to be different? What is going to be different about the way we live our lives? Are we truly going to uprise and rise up to see this world and the next generation, even behind you guys, come to know Jesus and stand for Jesus and stand on the truth in this world? He's going to use you guys if you'll let him. If you will rise up and get yourself out of the way and just let God do his thing. He can do it and he will. So you respond as you need to in just a moment. Would you stand with me and let's pray. And then you come and respond as you need. Father, 
I thank you again for this morning. Father, I thank you for this weekend. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us. Father, forgive us where we have made it about ourselves. Father, forgive us when we put anything above you and made everything else more passionate and more loving. And the only thing we talk about to others, if, if that's above you, please forgive us. Father, help us to walk away from here with a newfound passion and desire to see this world come to know you and to live for you. God, I believe in this young generation that you've brought. There is a reason why they were born at this time in history, Father, when the world just seems so jacked up and our nation just seems to be running to everything else but you. God, there's a reason why they are here. You use young people to change people's lives. Would you use them? God, help them to access that power, Father, to know it has nothing to do with us. God, you promised you would give us a helper. Help us to use the power of the Holy Spirit, God, to have the right words and to have the right love and to have the right truth to pour into people. God, if anybody in this room has just realized they're lost, they have nothing. They have everything in the world, but they have nothing because they don't have you or your son. Would you help them to be bold and courageous enough? And maybe they've been on the fringe for a while and they've been on that line, but they have just not been wanting to surrender at all. Would you help them to be bold to come down and to give their life to you and have their life changed forever? We love you, God, and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, you respond as you need.